I want to talk about two basically two uh, two uh, parts. Uh, one is the extension of the sound dome of uh, ZKM we recently did, and the other one is uh, the consequences of spatial uh, uh, spatial listening, uh, the consequences of co composition, and uh, I try to draw some outlines into the history of perception to give a background of this these consequences. So we extended the sound dome. Um, I'm not sure uh, if these extensions were used in the, in the performances uh, you heard, but that's what you saw yesterday. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the fact that the lowest level of the speakers are set to 2 meter 20, roughly, and you have the kind of spherical appearance of uh, the 43 speakers. This one is, uh, here it is uh, quite uh, um, perceivable quite well. And uh, this is, you can imagine, due to the fact that we want uh, the sound waves to propagate to every ear in the audience. Uh, so this is the representation of the speakers, but I do a mapping of the speaker setting to the space. This is the real positioning of the speakers. Uh, that means you have a, in the lower part, you have a, an, an area which is not used. Uh, it, it's ex exactly around, uh, about 2 meter 20. And if I compare this to the threshold of the sound tome, uh, of the rest of the sound tome, it's around 4 meter, 4 meter 20. That means basically that we have uh, uh, yeah, an ambitus of 4 meter, 4 meter 20, and an ambitus of 2 meter 20 we don't use. This is the reason why we didn't use it so far. Uh, we want that the sound waves uh, propagate to each of the audience. And uh, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, there was a, a symposium in uh, Sark in Belfast. And of course, you know, uh, uh, the ones who, who know the space, they have a three meter space below the audience level. And uh, I listened to several concerts uh, which are either fully packed or not fully packed. So there were sounds propagating down to the cellar uh, with, uh, where I could uh, perceive a uh, precise uh, location if the sound was below me. And in other cases where um, the audience was, where I was in, inside an audience which was masking uh, several of the high frequencies, uh, I could not uh, loca localize the sounds down below. But what I, what I could uh, perceive was that the sounds went below the lowest uh, speaker level. So I, don't, I couldn't say the sound is there or there, but I could say the sound is below, is getting lower the lowest speaker, uh, lowest visible speaker. That means uh, it made an impact, uh, the speaker on the ground made an impact on, on extension of the space available. So we decided to uh, extend uh, the speaker range to uh, a ring, or the, the sixth ring, which is uh, now placed on the ground. And uh, of course, you, you see that we gain 50% of height, 50% of amb ambitus uh, uh, compared to the former version. And uh, which one is this? Yeah, this is the uh, this one I showed already. Um, let me just skip that. I don't know why he jumped. This is weird. Okay, let me go to the one I mean. This. Uh, that means uh, that we have uh, this extended space, but of course we lose a little bit of the precise uh, location. Um, I think it is different if it's uh, laid out in, on, the, on, the, on the ground because there are certain reflections from the ground, first of all. Second, uh, since it's a triangular uh, approach, there is always, or most of the time, there's m uh, more than one speaker involved. So in case we have the problems of the lower speaker, for example, with the sound which is here, we have some additional sound over of the speaker, which is higher, providing some of the high frequencies. So only in the case the sound is really on the lowest level, 
we only have uh, the speaker uh, distributing uh, the energy of the uh, spectra en spectral energy. Um, that means in most of the cases uh, we could have a, a quite a good uh, force and back lo uh, location and a good uh, location which is saying uh, which is giving us the information that the sound is going below the lowest circle and that was well, for us very important and we did the test and, and the test was exactly uh, proving uh, what uh, i was uh, thinking it should prove that the ambitus of space, the feeling of space, uh, the feeling of movement uh, was much uh, higher than before. So we extended speakers uh, to these positions. There are not so many because, as I said, uh, the, the, um, the amount of points uh, being locatable uh, is probably less uh, on this lowest level. So it should be okay to use a certain, we used here uh, seven speakers in the, in one version, in another version we used six speakers, so one in the, in the front. So there are always two in the side, either one in the front and back or two in the front and one in, in back on this lowest level. And uh, what uh, the question uh, which comes along with the sound dome concept anyway is uh, what does it mean to to what we do now, I mean, a decentralized uh, presentation of, of a piece of music. And I was thinking quite a long time about this um, and try to find historical matches on, on, in art uh, where we have the same problems addressed. And uh, we, move, we move from basically this environment now back to the initial environment, which was uh, stereo. And the concept of stereo is, of course, you know, a central position, a sweet spot uh, model with uh, the sounds uh, distributed to a certain position of perception and a certain impression. And if you, uh, I come later to this as well, if you compare this to a composition like a symphony orchestra, uh, you have each conductor is dealing quite a lot with the equidistance of amplitude of all the instruments. Um, uh, that means there is a model of perfect representation of balance of all the instruments and voices. If I compare stereo in, in visual art, I would say uh, this is something like uh, watching a picture. Uh, I have a kind of centralized or optimized position uh, from which I can uh, observe this uh, picture. But as we know, like Picasso or this was El Siger, I, I, a, 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 um, a painter, for example, which works with uh, multiple perspective in one uh, picture. So that was the interest already to, to, to give up this central observation point to present uh, multiple aspects of something uh, in, in this one perception point. Uh, now this idea of uh, orchestra was, uh, here, this is a string orchestra positioning, um, at least the German uh, uh, way, the German positioning technique or way of, of uh, <laughs> positioning the instruments. Um, and it is related somehow, or what we do when we have a when we listen to a CD, we have the same situation that we have a perfect uh, distribution balancing of all the amplitude levels. That means if we are not inside sweet spot, we don't hear the proper uh, balance. And um, as well, the same, the same happens in the in the orchestra. I'm, it should be that the uh, places behind the conductor should be the only ones uh, to be sold. The other, was, the other ones should be left free because it's clear if you're sitting on the left side, you hear very loud the first violin, the second violin, if you, you, don't, you miss quite, uh, a lot uh, the celli. So there is some contradiction. Why do the composers work with an idea, with a representation of equidistance, uh, of um, equibalance? And then they have an instrument which doesn't provide the equivalence. 
Uh, it is a compromise uh, which is, there was no practical solution. They could not place the orchestra in one spot. But there is an option and, 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 and um, uh, let's say a different way how to, what we can make out of this uh, problem. Uh, for example, it's quite different uh, if we watch a uh, sculpture. A sculpture has not a centralized uh, perspective. A sculpture has a multiple, is an object of multiple perspective. It can watch the sculpture from left, from, left, from right, from everywhere, um, no. from everywhere. And now what we can do, it's, it's a little visual trick, but uh, it, it explains uh, uh, the, the, my intention uh, probably. We can flip the situation and go the other way around and say the emotion is uh, a consequence of multiple perspectives uh, to an object. This still has the, uh, the paradigm of uh, uh, optimized equivalence uh, of the composition in it. But uh, we start already to imagine that uh, this is, uh, especially when moving, uh, not anymore the case, especially when we have more and more perspectives or objects, in this case, objects. So each of the statue represents a musical object a sound, a certain sound, a voice, uh, how, how, however you call it. And this is the, the way we propagate now. Um, but the consequence is there is no equivalence. There is no ideal mixture. I might end up in observing one ob object and losing 10 others. Now you could think uh, it's not a new question because the people in uh, sound installation have addressed this question quite a lot uh, before. Um, but I think uh, there is a difference because the installations usually display very uh, separated object of sound, which sound at the same time, but they are they have a loose relationship be to, between each other. And the co composer usually tries to create a very close relationship between the objects. And this is a difference. So what, uh, like for example, harmony, a classical um, piece of music where you have a certain harmonic uh, concept uh, between the voices. So the relationship between the voices, I would say, is quite different in most of the installation, sound installation, than in a composition. And this makes it, uh, um, out of this reason, I would say, even if the sound installation uh, artists have propagated uh, spatial distribution before, much earlier, but the concept functioned in a different way than the composition. And uh, you can you can you know that it's obvious why this is be, uh, becoming an important topic. It's because we are faced with uh, spatial systems more and more. I like this photograph quite a lot. Uh, we have the uh, binaural recording systems. We have ambisonic microphones, which are uh, or the, which information are used to recreate uh, binaural sceneries uh, with uh, interactive devices like this HDC, uh, this uh, um, um, head tracked uh, systems. And that means we are uh, exploring now another dimension of the, um, of the spatial distributed sounds in, in smaller spaces, I mean, I mean with smaller gear with individual perception uh, beside wave field synthesis systems and uh, the sound dome, uh, VBAP systems, etc. Uh, as a consequence, I, I think we have to severely rethink about what we understand uh, as a composition, what we, what we want and uh, uh, how we perceive a composition. Because there, there's another, comp uh, another consequence beside the fact that we have not an uh, equibalanced uh, impression of a composition, which is the fact that we can now explore, we probably are 
forced to explore uh, the music. It's not only, I, I call it active listening, because you can turn your head, you can focus with your auditive focus system, uh, you can uh, pay attention much more extreme to several layers. For example, when, what you do when you listen to classical composition, you could uh, observe certain voices inside the construction. But if you have a spatial distribution of, of information, you could more actively uh, focus on uh, certain sound events, which are even more complex than, than voice streams. That means we have uh, now, we are now in a situation where we are faced with uh, quite a new way of um, probably observation, but as a feedback to the composers, comp uh, a new way of composition. We have to understand uh, the work in a, in, a, in a different way. Why do I say this? Uh, one reason uh, one, uh, is the observation that many composers are obsessed with the perfect mix of their, 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 uh, their work. So what they, they, can, they don't have to do this work anymore. There is no perfect. Uh, there is an ambitus, a maximum, a minimum uh, possible uh, in terms of perfection, in terms of mix in terms of what they have to do, that every sound is perceivable, but they have to address certain positions in their composition um, and to uh, make sure that these certain positions have a functioning uh, result. Um, I'm still not sure what uh, kind of uh, uh, consequences this will have because we, we are still... Um, I, I wouldn't say in the beginning, because since roughly 10 years, we have quite really good uh, spatial uh, projection systems, and they are spreading more and more uh, in the world. Uh, but there is still, uh, on the perceptive side, side uh, there's a lot to explore, and especially we teaching, uh, on the teaching side, teaching the composers this new aspect, there is still uh, a lot uh, to achieve. and. Uh, we have to wait probably on the next generation of composers who either work uh, on stereo with a, with a laptop, ignoring spatial sound at all, or do the opposite uh, and uh, work with uh, big immersive environments. I was much faster than I thought, uh, but this is all I wanted to present to you. Maybe we have, we have some time for discussion if you want. Thanks, Lutka. Any questions, remarks from the audience? Yes, please. Yeah, just a, a remark because um, we had a comparison uh, with the visual arts yet in the, our first talk in the morning. And I'm just astonished um, this comparison um, uh, with the visual arts and uh, with painting and, and uh, with sculpture uh, because you have an Im uh, immersive art and it's, it's simply architecture. And um, um, so this is just a remark because I'm astonished because you have it and also how architects work, for instance, uh, with changing light situations. Um, they have implicitly um, the sculptural um, effects, which has also a, a dynamic um, a component. So, um, yeah. Uh, the, there is one difference because uh, architects, architectures have acoustic. And uh, that means they have a different relationship towards sound anyway. Uh, if they want or if they don't want, uh, there is uh, so a sound omnipresent. So I would uh, say uh, uh, architect architecture is either if it's not um, using the extension uh, so much, it's uh, extended sculpture, but only simple environments I would call an extended sculpture. But uh, it is, I would say, it's a completely different thing than, uh, because they create immersion, immersion, uh, immersions um, and each space, each uh, ac uh, acoustic space is an, immer is an immersion. So I, I agree with you that uh, architecture is somehow uh, uh, 
doing this already since a long time, but I, um, I have a doubt, my doubts if you compare, can compare sculptures and architecture so well. So it was more seen in proximity. It was more seen in proximity between architecture and the sound. So this is it's just my astonishment that you you were focusing pictures and sculptures and not architectures and are looking uh, for. It's not identical, of course, but I see a, a much more proximity. Yeah, but uh, of, of course, uh, I could say instead of a sculpture in terms of multi-perspective uh, um, um, perceptive points, uh, architecture works, works as well much more extended even. Yeah, I agree. Mm. It is a remark and, and question also, and maybe enlarging this thinking, you know, architectural thinking. The thing is that when you are composing using, for example, super collider, you are using some mathematical equations also, yeah? So maybe there is an interesting solution that we can use the VR environment as a real representation on mathematical equations. I'm talking, you know, you have, for example, quaternion synthesis or another complex equations, and you can see it in this kind of environment, not as something real you, you can manipulate. Mm, so for, for, please forgot about the space, like boring VR space and boring game space like Cartesian 3D, not. Uh, we need the kind, so I believe that that this kind of spaces which can be represented in VR uh, is interesting f method of composing. What do you think about, you know, this kind of using VR for composing? We had uh, until Saturday, uh, last Sunday, we had a installation from Laurie Anderson Chalkroom installed uh, and what she did there is a, of course architecture. She created spaces and you could uh, walk through the spaces. Uh, so it's a representation of architecture and, and a, a pathway of, uh, of uh, yeah, different uh, composition elements. Uh, I think that's an extension of the idea of a composition as well as an extension of space where you have to walk through to perceive. But uh, in, in the immersive environments, usually it's, it is a case that you have, um, a, or it's a paradigm that you have at least a kind of direct or hypothetical direct uh, contact to all the sounds. There are no hidden sounds uh, in, a, in the wave field synthesis system or in, in the sound dome. While in this VR um, spatial environment, you can create this artificial uh, architecture where you hide sounds. Uh, that means it's a decentralized concept, a uh, diff different type of uh, interaction, a different interaction model, probably. I, I thought about another type of space. Please imagine that you are using new type of synthesis based on some algebras. So you have the represented space as something noted, you know, free and the object. Yeah, and it can be represented. You can be inside this, this noted space, yeah? And manipulate sound one by one mapping. You are changing some parameters in these equations and you observe changes of environment. Maybe it is a future, but we will see. Yes, yeah, I agree. Maybe, maybe a short remark to your... Uh, so there are some attempts, for example, when you work in every sonic domain, which is the spherical harmonics representation, a mathematical representation of the sound field, and then you start modulating in there. So you somehow modulate the sound field, but in a non-very physical way. So this goes a little bit in the, into the direction of having a representation format, which is mathematics, and then you modulate something in the mathematical domain. So in the mapping in the picture domain, and then you map it back to the physical domain and see what happens. So there are some attempts on this. It's perfect for that. Mm. Uh, Ludger, thank you for your talk. Um, so at the 
at the kind of core of, of individual perception here in VR is going to be um, HRTFs and you know these uh, generalized models are, are quite inaccurate for many many people. Obviously there are you know companies coming online for, for photograph your ear with your iPhone and send it in and so on. Um, do you see any other developments in this space that would help us um, get over this challenge of everybody needing an individualized HRTF in order to really perceive these compositions that we might make in this space? I could tell you an answer, but I would have the answer from this guy. He, he's, a, he's an expert, and so I don't, uh, uh, um, don't want to... Um, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> just to, don't want to take your word. Yeah. There are many attempts, so you can search huge databases with machine learning and whatever to get the best fit. So you do a little video gaming or whatever, or audio gaming, and you shoot some objects, and the machine learns what would be the best fit for your head of the HDF, so you don't have to get it measured. Other attempts, just take a cell phone, get a scan of your head, do a numerical simulation, get the best out of it. So, or you get a picture of an eardrum, you get the closest mix from a database that you transform, understand what this transforms in the HADF. So it's ongoing research, many, many, many research labs work on the individualization of non-individualized HADFs, to say it correctly. Um, but I think we'll come there very soon to get rid of appreciating uh, virtual audio worlds and just with your own HADFs. So I yes. think we'll get there. You have your HRTF on your USB stick and uh, put it in the amplifier uh, and then the calculation is done in real time and everything works. <laughs> that's, that's, that's already true since we have a standardized format, it's AES69 so far. So if you get your HRTFs measured in this, most of the device is now accepted. Mm -hmm. A very last question, please. Very? You have three minutes. Huh? You have three minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, hello Luca, and thank you for your talk, very inspiring. I would like to return to the picture where you showed the extension of uh, the Klang Dome with the uh, red speakers. It seems that you imply that uh, at this level it's um, somehow a reduced projection going on and uh, in that you take into account there's a masking effect of the audience at the low level. Uh, if I understood correctly, is there any sort of um, display uh, or measurement that one could apply to know the masking effects, the various masking effects at the various positions in the hall? That is something that I would be interesting to hear about. I could you, could you ask the question part again? I didn't understand this. Okay. Um, it's the right picture that you show, and uh, the red speakers somehow represent, as I understood it, a layer that is uh, less precise in localization mm -hmm. uh, because of the masking effect of the audience. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, is there any sort of measurement one could do in order to display what kind of masking effect you have in the various parts of the whole? from the audience. Mm -hmm. No, we haven't done uh, the measurement. It was a subjective observation, as many, uh, many starting points of research uh, uh, is. Um, the, the one problem with, with a measurement would be uh, where and how many people are surrounding you. And it, it's, you know, it, it, there are hundreds of combinations. Uh, but of course, one cat could start with a measurement of uh, empty space and some people surrounding you to get an idea of uh, what is going on. Uh, but we can inter at least we can interpolate some some part of the knowledge. We know that low frequencies uh, uh, have the ability to to bend. Uh, uh, second, we have certain reflections um, which we can backtrace somehow. Um, Third, as I said, we have the higher speakers which work together with the lower speaker. Uh, and we have, a, for example, a direction. If you uh, hear a sound going down, uh, we understand it is going down. And if it's going very uh, further down, but we don't have the precise cue, uh, does it further uh, go further down or not, then we uh, would 
interpolate uh, the tendency of the sound object. So there are many psychoacoustic or psychological um, um, aspects which help us to get a result, uh, uh, the result we, we want and uh, to, to make this compromise work. I mean, we, we had more than, more than 10, 12, 12 years uh, uh, n not have the uh, lower speaker because we didn't believe it would uh, have an effort. Um, uh, I was very, it was very to my surprise that it does, uh, and it was the, 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 the SAC situation with, that made it possible. But I think we have to learn, it's like building the violin, you know, we have to learn of what does work and what does not work, uh, and uh, um, then find explanations for it. <laughs> so, thank you very much, Lutka. I would like yeah. to close the session now for this morning.